Thank you. Good morning. It's a, a joy and a blessing to be here with you today. Uh, my lab looks at how we bridge the gap between what is learned and what is innate, and we use mice to approach this question. Mice explore their environment using the senses, smell, taste, and sound, and they use these senses to make decisions on how to take care of offspring, as observed here or not. And I have to say, uh, my work is motivated um, by, by these two people here. Uh, so these two are my parents, uh, and I assume, based on all the alcohol in the background, that this is my first birthday. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but my, uh, my amazing parents, my biological parents, uh, were also foster parents. So I grew up in a very dynamic environment where I had both biological, foster, and adopted siblings. And during the day, we had amazing uh, time in Long Island, living our best life. And in the evenings, when we went to bed, I would hear the stories of why they weren't with their parents and why they had to have my parents and what it meant to live a life where your parents weren't given the opportunity or had lived through stresses or traumas or they had lived through stresses or traumas that didn't allow them to, uh, to be together. I dedicate my work to them. So I explore how parents promote survival. And I'm gonna tell you that in, in three minutes in two ways. One is looking at biological versus adoptive parent brain and how those adapt in motherhood. And the second is how stress changes the brain over time via epigenetic inheritance. And focusing on the biological and adoptive brain, overall, when mice see a pup, mice moms will hear the sound of the baby crying, and they'll perform this behavior in which they'll go, they'll explore the pup, and they will successfully bring the pup, pick the pup up, and bring the pup back to the nest. And this is called retrieval behavior. Successful moms do this. Virgins, however, won't perform the task. They'll ignore pups, and sometimes they'll cannibalize pups. I will not show you that video, though. <laughs> but herein lies a very important question. How does an existing social cue, this case the sound of a baby crying, gain relevance after experience? It's the same cue, two very different behaviors that have two very different life, life decisions. We show that oxytocin, which is a love hormone, a drug that can be released from the body, when shining blue light, as I'm showing you here in this mouse, we can release endogenous oxytocin and make a virgin not cannibalize or ignore, but actually treat the offspring like her own and pick that pup up. We then can take these animals' brains and do a process we call IDISCO, which clears the brain. And that's shown here. Here are one of our mouse brains that we've cleared in the lab. It removes the fats from the tissue, but maintains the cellular structure. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to get images like this. What I'm showing you here is a whole brain scan of our mouse, where each one of these little, these little dots, these little stars here, is a neuron that fired during this experience. What this allows us to do is look at single neurons in the brain, at single neuronal specificity. That means excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, and different areas of the brain and say what was active during this time of successful or non-successful maternal behavior. We're able to get images like this, and for example, this is a massive brain correlation, but certain areas are highlighted in mothers versus virgins, looking at how they connect to one another. And for example, emotional regions are really highlighted uh, more so in the mothers and in the virgins, and so that really le leans into the behavior is the same, but what's happening in the internal state or the valence. Uh, the second area really exposes uh, what stress looks like, not just in a parent, but across generations. Uh, I'll note that science is rooted in humanity, and a lot of this work is motivated by observations during famines, for example, the Dutch hunger winter, shown here a man-made famine where the Dutch were cut off from food for protesting the Nazi troops. And what they showed is that the children and the grandchildren of those who suffered in the Dutch hunger winter had metabolic issues, hypertension, diabetes, even schizophrenia. And you could see a space where that would be detrimental, that would be maladaptive, except for if there's no food, it would actually make sense to hold on to the fat. So it would make sense to hold on to the sugar. So what does it mean to adapt in a space where the environment isn't adapting as quickly as you are? We explore this in the lab by looking at stressful experiences. An experience that we have is a light foot shock with mice, and we explore smell. And what you'll see here is if you have an animal with a light foot shock and you give them a smell in the absence of a foot shock, the animal on top will avoid the odor, where the animal on the bottom got a foot shock and an odor, but they, he didn't learn that odor predicted foot shock. We're able to look at those noses, look at the neurons that respond to that smell, and be able to do our brain clearing, dive through the brain and look at the neurons and look at the changes that happened after the stressor. And I'm gonna show you one bit of data um, coming from the lab, but this one bit of data really tells a beautiful story. I'm showing you here on the x-axis the groups 
We have a naive group that hangs out at home, unpaired, means they had an odor and a shock, but they didn't have them together. And then we have this group. The y-axis is the number of neurons that can respond to this odor. And what we see is the brain has a morphological change in response to stress. That takes a lot of energy from a biological organism. We're then able to take those males from this group, breed them with naive females who have never experienced the odor, and raise those offspring who have never even met their dad or experienced the odor. And what we observe in their brains is this. In the offspring of the paired animals, the animals that learn that odor predicts shock, there's a morphological change that's been inherited. We're exploring what does this mean with internal state? What does this mean when it comes to the emotions? And smelling that smell again, even in the absence of your parents. We're doing this with a, a gamut of behaviors. I've shown you how the healthy brain can change in parenthood, and we're exploring sperm and egg as well as the maternal environment. If you have healthy sperm and healthy egg, but a mother who was shocked, the environment has shifted, but both gametes are healthy. How does that change the development of the offspring? And this work really has um, blessed me in, in many, many different spaces. I, I think I have the most amazing job being a scientist. Uh, but really what motivates the work that I do continually um, are emails I get like this, where I've given a talk, and I'll highlight one important part of the talk, of the um, email. I considered not going to your talk as I was worried about the biological child bias, and my husband and I were in the process of adopting. This woman went on to find me at the end of my talk and shared with me that she was hesitant to approach, approach my talk or me because she thought about adopting and didn't think she could be a good enough mom. And she had learned that night from a scientist that the brain can adapt to be the best human being possible. And that motivated her to go on and change the trajectory of her life and the life of her offspring. With that, I'll leave you with a quote. Nature, nurture, either way, it's all your fault. <laughs> I thank my lab and my funders. Thank you for your time.